you're advancing uh, the concept of uh, the Capitalo scene when uh, the Anthropocene uh, as a way of understand, uh, understanding of our new, the new geological epoch that we're in where man, not, uh, not, not men and women, uh, are producing nature and now in the driver's seat. Um, and you're, you're advancing Capitalocene as a concept to, to in a sense, of, um, appropriate the, the concept of Anthropocene for, for other more political purposes. Um, also as a way of rehistoricizing actually what the Anthropocene is about. Could you explain your understanding of the Anthropocene and why we should see it as Capitalocene? Well, I think, again, there are two souls of the Anthropocene argument. One is a straightforward geological argument involved in the search for so-called golden spikes uh, and the geological examination of, stratigraph of stratigraphic signals. And I think that's one Anthropocene. I think the other Anthropocene, which has gained such popularity, is to recast the history of the modern world as the age of man, Anthropocene. I would say two things immediately. First of all, this is an old capitalist trick to say that the problems of the world are the problems created by everyone, when in fact they are the problems created by capital. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that as a result we should talk about the Capitalocene, that we have uh, a historical era dominated by capital, but it's not shaped by the steam engine. The steam engine has been hugely important. But if we look at the centuries between 1450 and 1750, we see an environment making revolution unprecedented since the Neolithic Revolution, the dawn of the first cities. And that revolution was marked by an increase in the scale and the scope and the speed of environmental change emanating from an Atlantic-centered capitalism that was unrivaled in human history. That large civilizations before had transformed their environment. We can think of uh, massive infrastructure proce uh, processes and projects, the Great Wall in China, the pyramids, all of that. But this took, period, to, took place, this revolution in landscape transformation and in, in, in environment making between 1450 and 1750 was much faster and transformed not just one region of the world, but one region after another, after another, after another. And that it was in these centuries that we saw not just a new dominance of commodity production and exchange in transforming global environments, but we saw new ways of seeing and knowing nature with a capital N, that is, nature became something out there, outside of society, and included many non-whites especially, included many women, uh, many people, many humans, perhaps most humans at the time were excluded uh, from humanity and given over to nature. Why? Because if you could turn nature into a set of objects, you could turn nature into a set of cheap objects. And you could use the cheap labor and food and natural resources and energy of the whole planet to support the project of capital accumulation and industrialization in a broad sense, not in the narrow sense of the steam engine, but to understand that the first step of this radical industrialization of the world in fact began with the transformation of global environments into a force of production to create something that we call the modern economy, but which is so much bigger than anything that could be contained within the, the term economy.